All right, we're back here on Unstacking the Deck, and I uh, got our guest on the line here, I believe. Sander, are you there? Jason Webber, are you there? Yes, I am. All right, cool. How are you doing, Sander? I'm pretty good, man. How are you? I'm hanging in there. Got a, another guest coming up uh, the second hour. His name's Bruce Gagnon. You happen to hear of him by any chance? Yeah, why does that name sound familiar? He's part of like the space peace movement. He's involved in some pretty gnarly stuff. Oh, yeah, I've seen him speak before. He's very good. Yeah, yeah, so we got him coming up. I just saw his Arsenal of Hypocrisy video. That was pretty good stuff. You should check it out. Uh, a lot of weird things about going on in space. Um, so, yeah, looks like we got a great show today. So this is uh, Sander Hicks. He's an author and a journalist. He was, um, I believe you still are, an executive producer and interviewer for INN World Report. Is that correct? Not so much these days, but um, I'm in between jobs, so I might go back and do a little work for them. I'm still have an open door over there at INN World Report Television. Cool, cool. And uh, yeah, and some of your work led you to become a 9-11 truther. That is true. And uh, you wrote a book called uh, The Big Wedding, 9-11, The Whistleblowers, and The Cover-Up. Uh, it's a small paperback book. It's less than 200 pages, isn't it? That's right, but it packs a punch. Yes, it does, indeed. <laughs> and uh, you're also the founder of uh, Vox Pop Cafes and the CEO. I was just watching a C-SPAN interview you did on the books. Yes. However, I've just resigned, and now there's somebody that's even better at running cafe businesses who has taken over for me. Cool. And uh, we'll talk about you know what that was all about uh, a little bit later in the program. And then also you've taken part in uh, New York Megaphone. It's a small publication. Is that still running? Would you like to say a piece about that real quick? Yeah. New York Megaphone is a community newspaper published in New York City. We print about 50,000 copies at once and uh, comes out about quarterly. Nice, nice. And uh, what was the last one about by chance? The last one was called The Real New York Issue. So I did a big story on FBI mafia corruption. There's a big scandal that kind of went ignored largely here in New York City where the FBI had one of their own working for the mafia inside of the FBI. <laughs> yeah, wasn't there like an FBI uh, mafia connection or maybe it was CIA uh, for the JFK assassination? Absolutely, yes, there was. Um, and we can go into that and com compare and contrast a little bit later in the hour. All right, yeah, that sounds like a good little thing to delve into. Um, so, yeah, you've also, uh, well, let's go over what you what you believe, and that's, uh, you said in an interview I was watching recently, is that you want to be the change. Um, instead of, you know, whining about everything that's wrong, to start to provide solutions and to attack the... Um, the powers that be in, in the New World Order or whatever you would like to determine. So would you like to speak a little bit about how you live that ideal day to day? Sure, sure. I consider myself on the left politically, but at the same time I value certain things about small business capitalism. So I'm sort of a lefty capitalist. And that me I've done that because I don't just want to be somebody who does activism you know, after hours, I want to be able to do activism full time. And so that means I want to like kind of create a job that allows me to, to be an activist 24 seven. See? So what I did with Vox Pop was I started this cafe, but it was a fair trade cafe. So all the coffee was always fair trade certified, which means that the coffee producers are paid fairly and that the coffee is produced under ecologically sound conditions good for the environment uh under democratic cooperatives so um and then with our the cafe business we were doing a lot of live events we had the newspaper as part of the cafe we were doing you know um getting people together and, and trying to get out of the the fear and the paranoia that's foisted upon us by the culture of militarism uh here in america and uh, try to you know try to heal the divisions between people of all political stripes and spiritual religious stripes, and try to like you know get people to come together and unify around common interests as a way to to you know sincerely defeat American violence and militarism and commercialism and all the vapidity, the emptiness of American culture, and try to you know 
kind of helped America kind of redefine what it stands for, what it should stand for. Mm. Yeah, I've read uh, quite a few books on the mass media construct and, and its influence on humanity. And uh, two of the best books I think that you could ever find on the subject are uh, Media Monopoly by Ben Bagdikian, and he was actually uh, involved in helping break the Pentagon Papers. Yeah. And, uh, and then another one is called Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television by a guy named Jerry Mander. Funny name, but it's real. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, they talk about the effect of the flicker rate. And I think Alex Jones covers this on his show um, every now and then. They'll talk about it. The flicker rate of the screens brings you into a trance-like state. And um, generally, and then also in uh, Media Monopoly, talks about how the advertisers pretty much dominate the airwaves. And so as a result, that everybody has a bunch of needs and desires that generally are not so natural and that our emotions are being commodified and put in packages and they're being sold to us and uh, i guess edward bernays had quite a lot to do with that have you ever seen the documentary century of the self by the bbc no oh, it's a great documentary it goes into edward bernays he was the nephew of um sigmund freud and he exploited people's primal urges and subconscious desires in order to get people to you know buy cigarettes and buy cars and all the things that has these weird sexual undertones it's very fascinating stuff yeah yeah i know bernays is the father of uh, modern advertising yeah he's definitely like the godfather of the whole uh, construct that's for sure um, all right, so we'll move on from the uh, media monopoly, and we'll talk a little bit about the underground media that you have uh, contributed so well to, and uh, that would be the 9-11 Truth Movement. Um, you have done a presentation that you actually came to our university a year ago about now, uh, and it was called Who Killed Dr. Graham? Uh, Dr. Yeah. Graham, you say, is perhaps one of the first like blatant victims of the... Uh, or the New World Order, or the, the government, uh, or the hidden shadow government that is uh, fighting against the truth movement. And uh, so would you say a little bit about what Dr. Graham was exposing and, and why he was killed and, and kind of how that happened? Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, you can call it the New World Order. I would just prefer to call it um, something that we can all agree on, which is the 9-11 cover-up, you know, which is a part of this juggernaut of American military power. You know, we spend $1 trillion a year when you total it all up on defense and war and aggressive war uh, in this country. So, um, you know, a New World Order is, is an okay term, but, it, you know, some people, I think maybe that term is sort of like more, I don't know, that kind of like... It's maybe not as inclusive a term as just, you know, straight up 9-11 cover-up because this guy, Dr. David Graham, is uh, an important piece of a larger puzzle of figuring out the truth about 9-11. And I think the majority of people are on our side, you know? It used to be kind of a cottage industry in which it was just, you know, people on the far left and the far right who were interested in 9-11 truth. But since Bush never found Osama bin Laden, uh, there's, you know, a lot of nagging questions about, you know, who exactly was guilty for for 9/11? The 9/11 Commission was highly compromised. We know that. There's been mainstream books, even the New York Times. You know that product of the New World Order. Is, uh, even the New York Times did a book. Um, one of their writers did a book called The Commission, which exposed the, uh, the highly compromised nature of the 9/11 Commission report and how Philip Zelikow, the Bush flunky that was the director of that commission, mm. how he actually was trying to use the commission to uh, justify a preemptive war on Iraq. So that's a very interesting book to check out. Dr. Graham was a dentist and he was a patriot and evangelical and he was down in Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, in November of 2000, he happened to meet two of the 9-11 hijackers. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if you, if you prefer the term patsies or yeah. so-called hijackers or just put the word hijackers in quotes for the time being are, are these two that he met among the ones that were still alive or, or do you know well i don't even know if that's true i mean there's some rumors that people are still alive of the hijackers and that's been that's been debated that's not part of my argument mm -hmm. but um he met fayed banahamad and nawaf al hazmi and he he um, he documented everything. He, he had an unpublished manuscript. He put videos on YouTube. You can actually meet Dr. Graham um, via the magic of Internet television if you just Google his name and my name and uh, go on YouTube. But um, he met uh, these guys 10 months before 9-11. He had suspicions. The FBI threatened him. The FBI would not uh, pay attention to what his suspicions were. 
So when 9-11 happened and suddenly, you know, just uh, two or three weeks after the uh, the 9-11 attacks, I think on September 27th, FBI suddenly releases the, the 19 faces of the, the 19 hijackers or so-called hijackers. Graham freaks out because two of them were, were people that he actually met in Shreveport. And it all began to kind of make sense a little bit that, that you know, that this is why the FBI was so hostile to Graham when he was trying to get them to look at, at uh, these guys. So um, he starts to uh, publish, he wants to publish this book about his experiences with the FBI and with the 9-11 terrorists. And finally in 2005, he's ready to uh, publish the book. The FBI warns him not to publish it. He's proceeding with publishing it anyway. And then suddenly, bam, he's poisoned. He's poisoned in a small town in Texas, and he later died. And it's a crucial story, because whether or not, no matter what you believe about 9-11, whether or not you believe those hijackers were the hijackers, whether or not you believe they were on the planes, um, you know, that's subject to debate. But for the time being, let's just take the official story, you know, at its, at, for you know, and judge, judging it uh, based on its own, like you know, face value, these same hijackers that Graham met, uh, Nawaf Al Hazmi and his friend Khalid Almidar, they were also the same guys that were living with an FBI informant in San Diego before they came to Shreveport. These are the same guys that the CIA did not put on the terrorism watch list when they were monitoring them at a terrorism summit in Malaysia in the year 2000. So it's it's a pretty intense story and, and the, the Graham story is, doesn't exist you know in isolation but in, in its historical context it becomes even more compelling because according to author Joe Trento Nawaf al Hazmi who Graham met was an agent of Saudi intelligence you know so now you're getting into like a you know a mega power you're talking about petroleum dollars and the the, the the delicate balance of trade between Saudi Arabia and USA and the Bush family and the Saudi Saudi royal family and um, so suffice to say it's a it's a it's a damn interesting story. Uh, I've tried to do this as legitimately as possible. I wrote a complaint to the Department of Justice. I told them to look into FBI corruption in Shreveport. They promised me a response, you know, a year and a half ago that never came. Mm. So it seems to me that 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 the uh, this is a huge scandal and it has yet to really break in the mainstream media. But I'm I uh, I'm trying to get a book deal. All right. Yeah, that uh, was a ridiculous story. Uh, I was shocked to hear it. And uh, just to like mention this, I we talked about it over uh, on, off the air for a second. But yeah, there was recently a Buffalo flight. And um, I don't know if you know much about JFK Jr., but his plane seemed to have just kind of fell out of the sky. <laughs> and there was a lot of things that were really kind of weird about it and conflicting uh, stories coming from the government. But recently, there was a Buffalo flight that had the widow of... Uh, victim of 9-11 and that this woman chose to not take the government payoff because they offered all the 9-11 victims a uh, monetary settlement and that part of the fine print of that agreement to take that settlement um, was to never be able to wage a lawsuit against the government for for whatever is deemed necessary by you know the victims families yeah and yeah was she doing a lawsuit though uh, yeah, she was, and she was involved in that. She actually met with Obama a week before the plane went down, and there was a Rwandan activist as well that was on the plane. Um, so it's it's very very bizarre, and um, yeah, that story seems to be have a lot of conf conflicting uh, answers. And I mean, once again, it's this federal bureaucracy that seems inefficient at serving the public and giving us public information that you know, let alone is is real. But I mean, at least even makes sense. In the very least, I mean, not even a good lie or good misinformation. You know, um, you know what the difference is between a liberal and a radical? What is that? A liberal wants the government to help them. Uh, a liberal believes that the government can help them, but a radical mm. realizes that they won't and they can't. Yeah, that's uh, getting to the root of the problem. That's what radical generally is. Yeah. 
Um, all right, let's segue back into uh, what you're saying about the Saudi connections uh, with 9-11 and, and, and Dr. Graham um, and these intelligence connections. I'm reading a book right now. Um, we actually have the, uh, the editor of it coming here next week. It's a political economy journal called The Hidden History of 9-11. And next Tuesday at 5 o'clock in Science B135 here at Humboldt State University, uh, the Department of Economics for my senior project, we're hosting him here. And he talks about the insider trade but his book is a collection of all these intelligence connections and all the other different factors that make it quite apparent that we weren't told the truth about 9-11 and there certainly is a cover-up. Um, and he talked about how some of these Saudi patsies uh, like just started flight training in the weeks preceding, you know, and there's no way they could have known how to fly a plane and whatnot. Um, so that's that's a 9/11 kind of Saudi connection on top of what you mentioned with Dr. Graham. Would you speak a little bit about uh, the the book that you wrote, uh, the unauthorized biography of Bush? Uh, what was the name of it again? Oh uh, yeah, Fortunate Son. I didn't write it, but I published it and edited it, and was the PR guy, and I did a lot of stuff for that book. But that book was by a, a Southern writer named Jim Hatfield, Jim Hatfield. who was uh, originally it was going to be published by St. Martin's Press in the fall of '99, and uh, there was a big brouhaha, and suddenly the, uh, the publishing deal fell apart. Mm -hmm. But um, this book had a lot of uh, dirt on Bush, and it had speaking of the Saudis, it had the Bush Bin Laden connection. The you know the documented business connection between Salim bin Laden and uh, James Bath and uh, George Walker Bush, uh, I.E. W. Uh, um, way back in you know the late 70s, and this was you know this is information that nobody really knew about, and nobody really knew who the bin Ladens were at that point, unless you were following the embassy bombings, and uh, so it was a, a pretty hot little title, and then um, it also happened to have the Bush cocaine arrest and. Uh, a Karl Rove plot uh, kind of exposed uh, the author's own skeletons in his own closet. So it was pretty tragic because the guy got the, over the course of the, of the history of the book, the author got totally destroyed psychologically and ended up taking his own life uh, right before 9-11. So, uh, of course, naturally you're going to think like, well, did he really take his own life? Mm -hmm. you know? Or are they especially tying up loose ends? Yeah, yeah, especially since that happened right before 9-11. But, you know, sometimes... Uh, I hate to tell you, I hate to break it to you, but sometimes a suicide is just a suicide. I, yeah, I know yeah. it seems unlikely, but, you know, you got to be logical about this. And I was pretty close to the guy, and so I, I, could, I could see what the whole experience had done to him. So really, it was the experience of losing his ability to feed his children with his book deals that was really um, uh, crushing his, his uh, self-esteem and crushing his, his livelihood. And therefore, um, and the guy had a pretty... Uh, we got a lot of problems, let's just put it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, once you go down the rabbit hole, it's uh, really kind of hard to keep uh, any kind of equilibrium, especially when, you know, harboring any of these uh, beliefs that the government is lying to us. It yeah. generally makes you part of this lunatic fringe, supposedly, as people like Glenn Beck like to call it. Um, and there's actually a couple other uh, weird suicides you just made me think of. One was uh, just before 9-11. Have you ever heard of uh, William Cooper? He wrote a book called Behold a Pale Horse. Um, yeah. Did he commit suicide? Uh, it wasn't exactly suicide. Uh, he, I, I guess, quick background on him, he was part of Navy intelligence after he says he saw a UFO. Um, he spent 17 years after he shut his mouth in the Navy intelligence community, which is pretty prestigious intelligence community. And, yeah, uh, it, I, right. Office of Naval Intelligence. Yeah, and, and in the end, he uh, when he retired, he started to leak things to the media, and immediately he was... Um, I guess federal agents came after him and I, I believe he was ran off of a cliff one day and broke his hip and they left him for dead but he crawled up the top and uh, survived and then in a second incident he was uh, t-boned by the same government car he says and ended up losing his leg and they visited him in the hospital and he said if we have to come see you again you're not going to survive next time and so what he did is he took his savings and wrote letters all around the world about the shadow government and plans for uh, you know, imposing like the FEMA camps, they're they're been built in this country, and they're they're trying to build more on military bases, and and this the new world order construct, and all these incredibly. Uh, controversial things that he knew about uh, that he was trying to reveal so he wrote a letter to everyone around the world said if I died then this is why and he actually had a radio show for quite some time and so in the weeks preceding 9-11 he was on the air and um, I forgot the exact date but yeah he was involved in a shootout with cops and they killed him 
Um, so that seems kind of like a bizarre way of going out. Um, but to get back on the suicide note, but everybody, anybody out there is listening to this, check out Behold a Pale Horse. It's, I believe, a blacklisted book, so you might want to pay for it in cash. <laughs> but uh, the DC Madam, did you hear anything about that? Oh, yeah, that was a great story. Um, Wasn't the there a 9 11 connection to that? Uh, no, I, I'm not aware of that, but that, it's worth talking about the, um, the long history of uh, prostitution scandals and the Bush family. There was a, a scandal I mentioned in my book, Big Wedding, having to do with male prostitutes visiting the White House, the first Bush White House in 1990, Yeah, the, the Franklin cover-up. In, uh... Right, exactly, exactly. And this is, like, not just conspiracy theory land. This is actual... You know, there was an actual documentary that was going to be on Discovery Channel. They, they pulled it at the last minute. There's a, there a book written by a former state senator from Nebraska. Uh, and it, it's, it's, a pretty, it's pretty interesting stuff. And you can see a lot of this on online on YouTube. Mm-hmm. And uh, But it has to do with some of the darker sides of power. You know, the darker... You, know, I'm sure, uh, you mentioned Sigmund Freud earlier. I'm sure he would, ha- he would have a field day with this. The, the, the suppressed homoeroticism mm-hmm. of, of, you know... Bush people in power, and uh, you know, there's uh, there's long been rumors of Bush's own uh, homosexuality with uh, Victor Ash, the mayor of Knoxville, Tennessee. And if you see this documentary, you'd think maybe well, there is something to it because of uh, uh, of, of this, you know, actual documented story of, mm-hmm. of power and sex and money. Mm-hmm. And and and, uh, and of course, it ended with um, the Bush family rubbing out their enemies. Craig Spence was. Uh, kind of like the, the pimp in all of this and he was somebody that was working for the Bush White House and he actually said I I don't want to get killed by the CIA but then a week later he was dead mm. yeah and um, just to kind of provide a little bit more filler on this DC Madam murder she was uh, the head of a giant escort service which was uh, a masking a prostitution ring and it was it involved all sorts of people um, I'm looking at an article now here about the 9-11 uh, conspiracy connection. It says that some of the, the girls may have had uh, foreknowledge um, of government complicity in the 9-11 attacks from their interactions with some of these government officials. Because on this list, when the, the Fed sees their, their database, and it had government officials, uh, lawmakers, judges, military personnel, all sorts of different people high up. And uh, the woman said that she was offered, I think, a plea bargain, and she said she wouldn't take it. She said, we need to, I want to expose like what you the lawmakers do that you're a bunch of hypocrites and she said repeatedly um, on Alex Jones and in other interviews that she would not kill herself and then mysteriously she was found hanging which is a way that women generally don't ever kill themselves and that women are rather um, they don't have a very high percentage of successful suicide and so it didn't really mesh with uh, general reality and, and most precedent but um yeah, that's that's pretty shady the way that she went out. And uh, also what you said earlier too about the the sex rings in DC. Uh, if anybody out there can go online and go to video google video.google.com and look up conspiracy of silence and it's about a boys home in yeah, Nebraska. Yeah, that's the documentary I just mentioned. But you know what? We should also talk about some positive stuff cuz people are going to be like <laughs> changing the channel or like no doubt. Just, <laughs> finding some humble stuff to smoke but uh <laughs> listen, <laughs> yeah right <laughs> listen i gotta say that like uh it's not all for for not uh not all is lost i'm doing a big conference around truth and transparency and right. re-identifying the country and uh rein- reinstating the rule of law around torture and bush and cheney and uh, 9-11 truth and this conference is going to be in new york city on 9-11-09 and i invite you all to come all right. That sounds get great. more information online. Just Google my name, Sander Hicks, and uh, it's on my blog on GNN. All the the outline for uh, what we're going to be talking about, and uh, we're going to have Richard Gage from Architects and Engineers for 9/11 Truth, uh, Luke Rudowski from We Are Change, New York. He's the founder of We Are Change. He's going to be a big part of this. We're going to have a big hip hop, rock and roll, punk rock concert to start it off, and uh, so it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be like two days of panels, kicked off by a big concert on 9/11/09 Friday night. Nice. All right, that sounds like it's going to be a great place to uh, synergize energy against the 9-11 cover-up, for sure. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, 9-11 happens to be, uh, it's a big anniversary for the movement, and it happens to be on a Friday night this mm-hmm. year, so... More people can make it, I bet. Yeah, exactly. God is on our side. 
Nice, nice. Well, that sounds like it's going to be a hell of a time. And uh, if I may not make it out there, I'm sure I'll hear one thing or another about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can also do an event in Humboldt. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, we have uh, we showed uh, Jason Burmis's Fabled Enemies last 9-11 for the 9-11 Truth Club, and the administration tried to come in and cancel the event the day of, um, even though we did over a month of advertising and planning on it. But the day of, they tried to kill the event. And uh, actually, uh, I'll segue into another thing. Um, we had this guy, Waleed Shubat, and I mentioned him in a conversation we had the other day. Can you uh, tell the listeners, because a lot of people are outraged on our campus, what do you know about this Waleed Shubat guy? I don't know anything. Who is this guy? Oh, I, I thought we talked about it. Uh, he uh, he had the uh, he provoked a sit-in in, in New York University, and there was a whole list of demands. He seems to be uh, he's a pro-Israel. Um, he says he's a former terrorist, but he can't really seem to provide any proof about it. Um, and so oh, I can't. Yeah, right, you know, okay, you know, no, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, th but I don't think he's pro-Israel. I think these these people were pro-Palestinians. I think they were Gaza. Activist. No, no, it's it's, and, and, it's the opposite. He he pretends that he used to be a PLO terrorist, and now he says he saw like the light of Christ, and now he's converted to Christianity, and uh, he, so he goes around preaching about how Islam is evil and must be wiped off of the face of the earth. And uh, there's a pretty serious outrage across campus with this guy's event coming here. You know, I don't know anything about that, but I'd love to hear more about how you um, defeated your arrest for stickering in the airport. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about that. How, what's, the, what's the latest on your uh, your your crusade against the law? <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, uh, that incident that happened, uh, I think it was July 30th or 31st on flight uh, 1165 uh, Delta flight. Um, yeah, the what ended up happening with that case um, after I was kind of dragged through the mud by the media and there's a bunch of misinformation and totally blown out of proportion um, uh, they tried to get me to settle for like a, a plea bargain and and give me some kind of an appeasement and say like all right well you won't have to keep flying back and forth I mean because it was costly to fly back and forth for multiple court dates over these last uh, 10 months or so um, but ultimately, after I held out long enough and my dismissal hearing was declined um, and other little motions were all being denied, in the very end, like when it was just about to go to trial and I was ready to get a trial date, the judge pulled the prosecutor aside with my attorney and basically said, like, hey, do you really want this case? And it was like, no, I don't want this case. And I guess they went through two prosecutors. Um, one of them was Harvard educated and was a lot easier to work with. But she mysteriously, I mean, it could be a coincidence, got kicked up to the um, Superior Court of the state of Massachusetts and she was moved up and so she I guess had arguments with my lawyer saying I don't even want this case it's stupid <laughs> because they've apparently given people pardons or not pardon but granted people a dismissal for apologizing when they threaten they have a bomb because they need money for their baby mama or something I don't know um, but so I was pretty much certain that there's no way that I'd be convicted but there was a chance and I was facing up to seven months but yeah last minute the judge worked out a little deal with the uh, prosecutor wait, wait, wait. I don't think the listeners are clued into what you actually did um, well, still, like, I got one more final, like, hearing to clear it up, so my lawyer doesn't want me talking about it too deeply, but... Oh, okay, all right, um, right, right, right. But, yeah, there were stickers wait, wait, on a plane. I, yeah. You say call? All right, uh... I'll, no, no, I'll no, 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 I, I was saying, I have another question for you. Okay, let's do it. Do you know about the Ziad al Jara uh, uncle that was recently arrested for spying for Israel? No, I haven't heard about this. It sounds oh, this fascinating. Is hot, hot story. It just All happened right. at uh, New York Times front cover p story. Actually, wow. ironically enough, the old gray lady is beginning to, beginning to catch on a little bit here. They did a, a front page story about how this guy Ali Al Jara, uh, a Lebanese, was arrested for spying for the Mossad. And I I saw the guy's picture and I saw the guy's last name and I was like, huh, he looks a lot like the 9-11 terrorist Ziad al-Jara, mm -hmm. and it turns out in the story itself, after the jump, you know, on the inside of the story in the Times, mm -hmm. they say, oh yeah, by the way, this guy is the uncle of one of the 9-11 terrorists, Ziad al-Jara. Hmm. And so one of the things I wrote about earlier today uh, is that this is really interesting because Ziad al-Jara was one of the pilots of uh, uh, Flight 93, or uh, I think that's that's pretty certain. You know, there's lots of uh, video that corroborates that he, he was on that plane, and there's audio uh, of the, them taking over the plane. 
And this is the plane, you know, that was likely shot down over Shanksville. Mm. And, you know, the, the, the disaster site was something like eight miles wide. And the yeah. official story is that Ziad al Jara decided to ground the plane. You know, and even the movie Flight 93, um, you know, uh, indulges in the same old official story myths that are yeah. really highly problematic and illogical that the terrorists would just decide to bring the plane down. Mm -hmm. You know, when it's pretty obvious, you know, when, when the engine lands a mile away from the rest of the wreckage, it's pretty <laughs> obvious that... Uh, yeah, the debris field was so big that the plane had to come apart in midair, which suggests exactly. it was yeah. struck and, and by there a were, missile. There was, yeah, there were plenty of other planes in the air, fighter pl fighter jets and stuff. Even my mom, who's like, you know, a conservative Catholic who doesn't really go for 9-11 truth, she was, <laughs> right after 9-11, she was like, oh yeah, they shot that plane down. Pretty clear. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to tell the American public that because it would be demoralizing, so you have to keep on pulling the, the wool over their eyes. But anyway, it's a really interesting story because um, it, 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 uh, it's like, wow, you know, it's the way intelligence circles work, if, if, you're, if, you, if you have a family member who's a spy, it's, it's likely that you'll be recruited or given an opportunity to spy, mm -hmm. you know, either for Mossad or for, you know, who's, who's really handling Mossad? Well, that would be CIA, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who are the funders of Israel? Well, that would be our country. We're, mm -hmm. You know, we, we give Israel, uh, Israel's in the top three of, of, the, of uh, foreign aid that we give to uh, other countries. Followed by things. what? Egypt and Colombia, correct? No, but you're close. Egypt and Pakistan. Actually. Oh, Pakistan. wow. Right after 9-11, Pakistan became number three. Yeah, with the, uh, with the $10 billion in foreign aid that they got to help us yeah. uh, with, with the war in uh, Afghanistan. So, um... So it's a really interesting story because Ziad al Jara never really made it, never really fit the profile for radical Islamist terrorist anyway. This is the guy that, you know, was hanging out with uh, the, the, the flight school instructors down in Florida. He was he would drink beer and uh, play music with them, and he was just like one of the guys. He had the girlfriend in Turkey, the Turkish girlfriend. He would visit her in Germany several times. He was flying back and forth uh, at Liberty right before 9 11. Um, and I, this is something that I just got this from this morning from doing a little research on Wikipedia that Ziad Al Jara um, might not have realized that 9/11 was going to be a suicide mission because he actually he bought a suit for a wedding and, and was was telling people he was going to be at a wedding in late September of 01. Mm -hmm. And uh, so interesting stuff there. And his uncle was spying for Mossad too. That kind of further proves. Uh, connections to CIA and uh, other other uh, groups of foreign intelligence assets. Yeah, I was reading in this uh, the hidden history of 9/11 by uh, that economist that edited Paul Zaremka. In the first chapter, they talk about the 19 hijackers and they they talk about the use of doubles, not only doubles in like stealing the identity of people that are perfect patsies, um, but also the possibility of using doubles in the drills that were run that day. So there were the military operations, and then that's also how potentially this guy had no clue what was really going on. Absolutely, that's part of the official. Um, you know, you can actually get the transcript that says uh, that you know the FAA and the NORAD people actually said, "Is this real world or is it exercise?" Mm -hmm. And then there's yeah. a new video that came out with NORAD guys joking about the hijackings, saying, "Oh, I never thought I'd wish for Value Jet to come back." Ha ha ha! And then there's a guy that says, "Oh, I'm glad I'm not flying anytime soon." They said, "Don't worry, Dave. We'll carjack you on the way home." And they were all just joking and laughing it up while American lives are being effectively sacrificed for the military industrial complex as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, they probably didn't know that the, the, the hijacking, hijackings were real at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so they thought it was just all a big game. Yeah. Um, all right, well, let's uh, squeeze back down to uh, what we were talking about earlier with the, the Fortunate Son. Wasn't there a documentary done about that called uh, Horns and Halos? Yeah, that's worth checking out. You can get it on, like, uh, BitTorrent. And so that would go through the, the tragic story of that, that author's pursuit to publish the book. Yeah, exactly. You can, you can again, see the guy and uh, kind of meet him and uh, um, get it on Netflix or BitTorrent or whatever. And, right. uh, yeah, it's called Horns and Halos, and it's uh, won awards. And uh, I didn't make it, but friends of mine made it. Cool, cool. Yeah, it sounds like a good one. And then there's another movie that's uh, more uh, closely related to you that I guess you didn't really authorize exactly, but uh, was it uh, Able Danger? Yeah, yeah, that's a um, cinema noir. Um, it was made by this guy that read, read my book, Big Wedding, and he kind of did a, a film that's sort of a tribute to uh, 
big wedding and uh my cafe vox pop was in the film and um and it's good. Yeah, I had to see that film like a couple of times to really start to enjoy it. The, um, <laughs> but but once you, it's it's uh, it's a, it's it's a little bit different from Horns and Halos. Horns and Halos is more of a documentary, and this is kind of mm-hmm. more artistic uh, cinema noir. So it's like based on a true story type status, right? Kind of, yeah. All right. right. Yeah, and if you like Hal Hartley films, um, one of his actors, Al- Elena Lowenthal, is this sort of. German accented femme fatale and and you'd like it they've got references in the film to the monarch program and you know sexual mind control slavery and mm-hmm. all these kinds of things that are uh, that are also covered a little bit in my book have you heard of uh, Kathy O'Brien I don't really want to get into it because it's such yeah. a horrible story <laughs> oh my god if, if yeah. anybody out there wants to be depressed look up Kathy no, O'Brien no, no. <laughs> yeah I know I know what you mean it's kind of it's hard to tell sometimes who's for real and who yeah. is you know speaking of doubles you know I mean, there's, there's been allegations that she might even be a double for for uh, other people I mean it's hard to tell mm-hmm. it's hard to tell it is exactly. I, I was looking at comment threads after my, I was arrested and it was like oh this guy's CIA operative trying to discredit the truth movement because <laughs> I mean, the way they made me, the way they made me sound, they made me sound like I'm, uh, you know, like on drugs and, and just being hysteric and flipping around crazy and saying I ran off these planes when they were orderly evacuated. I mean, it's just so ridiculous. So even the character assassination by the mainstream media or other interests can lead to, you know, uh, conclusions that aren't really quite accurate. So, I mean, yeah, it is hard to tell. Absolutely. Yeah, and there's always there's all there's so much bad mouthing of activists, and you have to kind of wonder where it's coming from, mm-hmm. you know? Because, like I was saying when I talked there at Humboldt State last year, there's a really good book called Beyond Bullets. It's by a professor named Jules Boykoff. Yeah, I actually got that from you then. Oh, good. Yeah, did you read it? I've gone kind of like halfway through it. I'm, okay. I'm, I have a very splintered reading habit. <laughs> no, I understand. So do I. I'm, I'm reading a couple books at once uh, usually, but um, the. Um, uh, and remind me to talk to you about Iron Triangle in a minute too. But right. in, Be- in Beyond Bullets, Jules Boykoff talks about like the bad mouthing that goes on amongst activists, and it's it's strategic. You know, this is what the FBI does. They mm-hmm. actually do this as a strategy to create divisions within activist movements. You know, mm-hmm. and they they've done it before, and they're still doing it. And uh, you know, even in our in our scene here in New York, in the 9/11 Truth activist scene, that's you know, it's it's splintered amongst factions, and I'm trying to heal the divisions for this mm-hmm. big conference in the in the fall. And uh, I'd say one of the most uh, outrageous examples, where it's almost like. Um what is that when you dissect something like straight down the middle and look right through it it is just such a clear picture of uh, the inside of CIA operations and FBI and, and their tactics to discredit people there is just something called the counterintelligence program Cointel Pro for short and it was a series of covert and illegal projects conducted by the FBI aimed at disrupting dissident political organizations within the United States. And, uh, yeah, they fought against... They said that they were there to protect us from the Ku Klux Klan initially, but they ended up turning against the Civil Rights Movement, the Black Panther Party, Martin Luther King, who was assassinated. There's a court ruling. Uh, William Pepper was the, the lawyer for the Patsy, and he wrote a book called An Act of State, The Execution of Martin Luther King. And so that's an extension of Pro operations, and it's uh, absolutely outrageous. But it shows yep. quite clearly... They didn't know that this was even real until some of the activists broke into an FBI field office and stole documents to expose this operation. Right, right, exactly. Exactly, yeah. COINTELPRO is real. And, it, you know, it's funny. I, I remember when the first time I heard about COINTELPRO and uh, FBI suppression of American dissenters and American, you know, peace and social justice movements. And I told my parents about it, and they were like, oh, well, I don't think that happened. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like... Sometimes people just choose not to believe it, when even if it's historically sourced. And uh, but yeah, I mean, technically, COINTELPRO was shut down in like the uh, in the seventies, but you know, the government doesn't isn't going to shut down 